Hello, and welcome to Under the Pressure, a show where we interview everyday people about what motivates them to find happiness in their lives. The first of this four-part series is about individuals who have discovered a talent that they possess and are motivating themselves to do it. First up, we will be talking with Eddie Harris. Eddie is a motivational speaker and businessman who takes a slightly different approach when having to encourage others. Let's see how Eddie applies his motivational tactics to enrich their lives. Um, my name is Eddie Harris, and I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I like the city of Charlotte so far. Um, I definitely see a future for myself here. I believe that Charlotte is a city of opportunity. Um, because it's emerging, we're not necessarily Atlanta yet, and we're definitely far from New York, you know, things like that. But we're definitely like a, a city I think that is budding with like young entrepreneurs, young professionals um, who have an idea about how to create a city that I think can be really buzzing. I think that communication is important because it's, it's how we connect with each other. Um, it's well, one of the ways that we connect with each other. And I think that it's important to understand communication um, in order to know how to better interact with each other just as on a human level. In, in studies, like we talk about like what's happening while you're communicating. So like there's your nonverbal communication, there's noise, um, and noise can be internal and external. You know, knowing those different components of things that go on with communication can also help you have better relationships and interactions with different people. As far as with youth, I think that it's important to know the ways that you're communicating and how it affects people. And so while you're talking to your kids, trying to set a good example, there's different research that will show that like, you know, your kids are most affected by the children that they associate with at school or what they watch on television and things like that. And so that would be like the noise in conversation or the conversation that's going on. And so it's important to know about those things so you can know how to better communicate and, you know, interact with your kids and, you know, the youth of today. Um, I think Jaden would feel, um, based on paper, I've done a couple things and like it, it may be proud of that. Because of the person that I am, I would hope that Jaden would feel more proud of the things that like I failed at and like how I've remained resilient um, in trying to be someone better. So it's not, it's the stuff that I can't put on paper. You know, I graduated with that degree, but like I was kicked out of school too. I got back in and I kept going. You know, my business now is kind of starting to take off, but I had two businesses that I tried to start before that didn't work. The empathy that I have for people, the love that I try to share on a day-to-day -day basis, the stuff that I'm trying to post through Facebook, the stuff I'm trying to put out in the world. And so he would be proud of the fact that I, I'm still going and that I'm able to fail and kind of stand up to those things. Whenever I need to prepare myself for like motivating someone or to um, hopefully try to empower them to do something, the first thing I do is that I actually go through the list of things that like have not worked for me, the things that I've failed at. You know, I go through that list mainly because it puts me in the, hum the humble place of recognizing that failure is a part of it. Humility is a part of it. Being vulnerable, being embarrassed, falling on your face, you know, all those things are a part of it. And so whenever I, whenever I go before someone, I'm like, you know, I have to first be vulnerable and open and own everything that's a part of my life and not just kind of come up and paint a pretty picture, but paint a real picture. Your life is going to be beautiful, but you're going to also have some hard times. And so that puts me in a perspective to better know how to speak to someone and reach them where they are. I don't know that it always works. I don't know that my purpose is like to get people to a certain goal as much as it is to get people to think for themselves and to think a certain way. And so I think oftentimes I'm meeting with people to say, have you ever thought, you know, about how often you think about the negative? That, you know, this could always fail and like these are all the things that could go wrong. And for every possibility, I'm assuming that there's also an, an, a chance for it to go right. You know, but there's never that possible thought process. There's no, and so I think my, my hope is to get people to think along those lines to kind of change that. I had to come to realize that when you're not, when you're not at a certain place, you're not ready to handle a certain thing, you can't force yourself to be there. And so you have to, that's actually a part of the process. Like that's a part of it. Recognizing that you're not ready to change yet, but understanding that the change is necessary. When that situation happened, I actually came to campus. It's complicated because, you know, in the work that I do with students, I'm there to help create a dialogue. The students there are diverse. You know, I have brown body students, I have white students, I have students who are some variation in between. And I feel like when that situation happened, it's hard to talk about it with people who can't be vulnerable. And so the reality is that statement harms students. There are students who felt belittled, you know, like they weren't 
included, that they were important because of that statement. And then there were other students who didn't really get the point, who are students of color. You know, then there were white students who of course just weren't aware of it, didn't really feel comfortable participating because they're not exactly sure how to talk about racism. And when I showed up to it, I was saying that it felt like the comments were made in distaste, like, the, like just a slip of the tongue, like you weren't really thinking, but racism is also implicit. And so we have to talk about those things and it's complicated. But what's required in those conversations is the vulnerability for all sides sitting at the table to be able to understand what it means. We have to call racism out, but we also have to understand that like it's, a, it's innate in all of us, I think, because of the society that raised us. I think that we're still talking about situations like this because we haven't really dealt with the history. As we know, in our country, history has been rewritten multiple times by the people who benefit from the systems that were created to ostracize some and to promote and uplift others. For instance, it's just like the conversation about crime. We, there are areas that are, that are crime areas. But if we're gonna talk about those crime areas that are densely populated by people of color, we have to talk about white flight. And if we talk about white flight, we gotta talk about desegregation. If we talk about desegregation, we gotta talk about segregation. If we talk about segregation, we gotta talk about the Jim Crow South. If we talk about Jim Crow South, we have to talk about the abolition of slavery. Then we gotta talk about slavery. And then we gotta talk about slave trade, you know, you know what I mean? And if we go through the history, then we start to realize that these, these problems were created by people in power who have always wanted to make sure that the masses are uninformed about how these systems came to be. And so of course, at a PWI, when black students are primarily in leadership positions, a comment like this surfaces because we're still in the remnants, in the residue of the history that we have never faced in our country. And so I feel like until more people are educated and are able to sit down and face the very harsh reality that like we live in a white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist, patriarchal country, <laughs> You know, people won't get it, you know? And so we'll still be having this conversation. Um, I would say to students of color, it's so easy to give into respectability politics, to try to alter yourself to fit into the society that's letting you know that like literally the way that you exist can be rebellious. The way your hair grows out of your head, the dialect that you speak with, um, the music that you listen to, unless this can be beneficial for, you know, profit. Don't stop being proud of your, your blackness because included in your blackness is like centuries of intelligence, scientific breakthrough, civilization building, art, wisdom, embedded in like who you are is everything that the society tells you that you're not. So don't let this situation where somebody misspoke out of ignorance cause you to question yourself and who it is that you are. I would say to people of color who kind of agree with the statement, I don't necessarily think that you need to feel bad about having a position. I would show up first to be empathetic towards those who were hurt by it. Cause you may have an experience where it didn't impact you that way, but it did impact you know, your brother or sister that's beside you, regardless of what race they are. And to people who are not of color, I would say to kind of, this is the time to kind of sit back and listen. And if you have the words of wisdom to say to your colleagues and your brothers and sisters beside you, then I would say speak with the knowledge and the understanding of the history of our country. Even if it's like a, like a seemingly like harmless statement, it's the reason why certain people don't get certain jobs and why certain people are, even if it's just followed around the store, that's an experience that impacts that person. It's something that has to be dealt with with caution and extreme delicacy, so yeah. I believe that empathy is what drives me. It's like I believe, like I feel like before I felt, I've always said love, you know. But I don't think you can love if you don't if you're not empathetic. You have to be able to position yourself to put yourself in the shoes of the other person, whoever it is. And then I believe that's whenever you can really open yourself up to love and give that love to people. So I feel like I wake up every day, and most days I try to post the status on, online. And I don't do it because like I want people to like it. You know, truth be told, I don't, you don't have to like it. I hope you read it, but you don't have to like it. The point is, I want to put that love out into the world because I think that's what the world needs. If there are more people putting love out there, putting that power that comes from within out into the world, I believe it would make it to where some of the problems and some of the things that we're dealing with could start to dissipate because there'll be more people dedicated to changing it. I want to find another word, but I'm gonna, I am gonna go with empathy. I, it's the thing that I wish I could see in more people. I think that evil exists where empathy does not. And so it's easy to like not care about the homeless whenever you don't imagine, or could never imagine yourself as a homeless person. It's easy to, um, to be harmful and hateful towards a group of people that you could never see you know, being a part of like your circle or being you. And I feel like I wish that more people had close to home moments um, because I think it'll have you like, okay, well we need to like end poverty for real. You know, we need to end discrimination for real. We need to end systems of oppression because it affects everyone. And if it affects 
that person across the street, it could absolutely affect me. The other, the other part of that is that I think that we're all literally like a few decisions away from being anybody else. You know, had I had my parents just lived in another area, I would have had a completely different upbringing. Had my parents decided not to be together, you know, I could have existed in a different body. Who knows like what outcome could have happened with my life. And I think when you think that way, it, it makes you interact with the world differently in a way of love and embrace. I definitely believe that it's my duty to inspire people because I've been given so much. I don't think that I would be the person I am today without people who inspired me to want more for myself. Because now my dreams aren't lofty in the things that I want as much as it is the things that I want to put out in the world. Like I want people to feel like the world was better because Eddie was here, you know? And that's what I want everyone to feel that they have the power within them to do for someone else. Even if it's only one life. It don't have to be, you know, 50 million people. If somebody watching this is touched and it, it changes the way they interact with their family or they interact at work or they love themselves, I'm good, you know? And so if I claim to care and love people, I don't know why I wouldn't be out here trying to encourage and inspire people. Like, I feel like it's a requirement of my life. What tip? Tip or tips? It's always so hard because I feel like I'm always trying to give people a lot. I would say one of the key things I think that is necessary to motivate yourself and to you know, lead to your best life is self-love, the work of self-love. You have to unlearn whatever you need to unlearn, cut off whatever is in the way of, take down, honestly, whatever is in the way of you loving yourself. You have to vigorously go after that self-love because you, you don't know how to exist in this world and you don't know how to love other people until you have that understanding of who you are and a love for that person. Not just an understanding like I'm, I'm this terrible person, you have to love who you are. I would say the other thing is to just go ahead and embrace everything that you're scared of. So fear, you're not gonna, you're not, gonna not be afraid. But once you understand that fear is a part of the process and you learn to step anyway, you'll get over it. You, you'll be like, all right, I'm scared, but I'm doing it. Get over fear, get over failure, you're gonna fail. And that's all right. <laughs> Um, get over um, scarcity, get over lack. You'll have times of lack. You'll have times when you do something and it seems like everything's stripped away from you. That relationship is gonna be gone. You know, a family member is not gonna be there anymore. Money might get funny, you know. I hate the Ron, but you know, all those things are gonna happen and you're still gonna be okay. I think if you, were, if you work on those three things consistently, I think honestly you'll have a beautiful life. Um, a lot of these things are still in the works, so like I'm, We'll see um, what the dates are. Um, I'm supposed to be speaking on UNC Charlotte's campus with one of the professors that wants to do a program. Um, there's also a conference coming up that I should be speaking at, but still, you know, iffy on that, we'll see what happens. And I would love the opportunity to work with the UTOP program again um, and speak to their incoming freshman class. As far as business is concerned, um, in the new year, I will be relaunching my branding agency. I think that's gonna be Whew, a good time. I feel like it's already kind of exciting. Things are already kind of getting rolling. I'll be putting out videos about branding and self-empowerment because I think the two go hand in hand. And so everybody can look out for that. Absolutely, you can always, always reach me on Facebook. My name is Eddie Harris. I'm sure you'll find me um, or through friends and things like that. Um, you can also find me on Twitter. Um, my Twitter handle is Floyd underscore D underscore Android. And I'm on Twitter. It's Eddie Not Edward. I don't do it a lot, but I'm trying to get better about that. You can always email me. Um, my email address is eddiefharris at gmail.com. Every breath that you get, it's an opportunity to give something back into the world. So with every inhale, you can exhale something great. You can exhale love. You can exhale courage. You can exhale peace. Um, you can exhale freedom. Um, but with every breath that you get, make an earnest effort to make your life and the life of everybody that you touch, you see, people that will never meet you better. It's that you have to trust yourself. Nobody knows your life better than you do, and no one else is gonna be able to pull what you need out of you like you can. And so, invest in the time to learn how to trust yourself and to unlearn whatever you need to unlearn in order to do that. Next up, we sit with another Charlotte native, Ronald Duncan. This man's rapidly advancing career is a marvel to look at, but his drive is really something to pay attention to. Listen in and hear what keeps Ronald's engine going. Okay, my name is Ron Duncan. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Spent most of my time growing up in the university area, actually, so not too far from here. Um, haven't really moved from that area either. Still there. Okay. I don't know. 
<laughs> my parents definitely played a major factor in you know where I am today. You know, they were kind of cut and dry with how things were going to be done. And, you know, you were kind of afraid to kind of veer off that path. So, you know, it was, you know, a thing of, hey, this is how you do things. This is why we want you to do it now. Do it. For me, that's kind of how I am now. You know, I, I kind of figure out what am I supposed to be doing. And then I figure out how to do it and I make it happen. Oh, man. What did I aspire to be? You know, to be totally honest, I really didn't aspire to be anything. I know I like to do things for, on my own. Got my first job when I was 15 and my parents actually tried to get me fired from that job. I think the biggest thing that I aspire to do, you know, to be is better than what I was before. You know, always trying to figure out different things to do. I was always into stuff, you know, just stuff I wasn't supposed to be into. But hey, people are like, hey, don't touch that. Why not? I'm gonna touch it anyway, just to figure out. And I just wanna know, you know, I just wanna know I'm very, I'm a very curious person. So, you know, just finding out life in general, like, not a real purpose at that point in time, but just being curious. Back to the childhood thing, you know, you see your parents doing so much for you, so you can do, so you have to do so little for yourself. And for me, it's kind of like, okay, I see that what hard work really looks like. You know, a lot of people complain about, oh, I'm tired, oh, this is too hard. But do you really understand and really know what tired and too hard really means? When you're in charge of a family and you may not have everything that everyone else has, but you don't have everything you need. But at the end of the day, it may require you to do more than you want to. You know, when I see when I see that in my family, it inspires me to do the same thing. There is no, okay, let me try my best. Let, just let me do my best. I'm going to be the best. You know, whatever the best is at that time, that's what it is. But at the end of the day, what I produce, what my results are at the end of the day, that was my best. And for me, I can rest easy knowing that, okay, if I look back at my mother and my father, is this the effort they would have put into it? And if it's a yes, then I'm okay with myself. I think the one thing that brings us back together is the fact that we want what's best for everyone. And so, you know, everyone's always trying to interject their opinions and what they think and what they feel. But at the end of the day, we have to realize it's not what I feel is important, it's what you feel is important. I may not agree with, you know, the route you're taking or what you're doing, and I'm gonna, you know, make sure you understand I don't agree with it. But at the end of the day, I have to let you choose that path. And two things are gonna happen. You're gonna do a really good job, you're gonna succeed, or it's gonna be kind of like, tried to tell you, you know, but hey, let's figure out how to get you back on track. So I think the common ground is, what do we need to do to make you succeed in what you're trying to do? When I first entered college, management was not on my mind. I didn't realize it was for me or that I didn't even realize that's what I wanted to do. You know, even though previously I had worked at Carowinds and management for five years at that point, um, I actually started in pre-med. Right, I wanted to be a doctor. You know, dollar signs was my motivation for that. Right, started with the pre-med program, took first chemistry class, Failed. Failed miserably. Biology I was okay in. And then, you know, after the first semester I realized, you know, sir, this is not <laughs> this is this is not it. I know what you were thinking, you know, but in my mind it was still okay. I need to figure out what can I do to make the most money. So the end of my sophomore year is when I really found out, okay, this is what I want to do, and that's when I finally switched my major to management like it should have been when I first entered college. Living you learn. My, my dad, he, he's the one who's always, okay, so what's your next step? All right, so you got there, okay, what do, he's, he's always, what do we need to do to get you to the next step? I'm like, well, I need to figure out, you know, what I'm doing here first, and then I need to figure out the path to go next. I think my mother is more of the, the cheerleader. She's out there, everybody knows, yeah, my baby works in me. It's like, mom, okay. Everybody that I meet, you know, I might not know them right off the, right up front, but if she's talked to them about me, Oh, I heard you work at this place and you manage this place. And it's and it's funny because I'm like, thank you. I'm like, no, she's already done went around Charlotte telling everybody. And, it's, <laughs> you know, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool, you know, to have somebody who's super excited about what you're doing. That thought has crossed my mind. And then it left my mind. Because here's my thinking. I have never been in school without playing a sport. Elementary school, I have, like, never. I don't know what to do while I'm in school and not play a sport. You know, like, you can go online. Well, here's the thing about it going online. That means I don't really have to do it. You just put it online and say, hey, sir, we need you to do this work by midnight. I think the, I think the, the, the real reason is when I, when I look at my career path, 
a, a master's degree would be beneficial for me, but it wouldn't be really beneficial for where I want to go. It's all about the experience that you get from, you know, running your own store and, and being around the people in your organization that gets you to where you want to be. You know, it's the impact that you put on your organization that drives it forward that gets you to a new level. The biggest thing, you know, for me is I, I strive not to be a manager at all. I don't want to be a manager or a boss. I despise those words. I, I want to be a leader. Leadership comes in different forms, but it's never, it cannot be taught. You cannot read it. You, got, you have to live it, you have to experience it, it has to be you. Junior year. I was coming into my own in, on the track. My grades were good. I knew what I, wanted, what I wanted to do in life. We won conference that year, you know, and the team, you know, we just had a great team, you know, everything was going very well in life in general. We had a lot of good times. A lot of good times. I used to work at the basketball games like, and I would literally stand on top of the counter and yell, basketball, one shot, three dollars. You know, I would do that and then, you know, at the, at the water race games, you know, the faster you talk, the, the more people are interested. So I'm sitting there like number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, number ten, number winners like number one, woo! By doing that, you know, they gave me the opportunity to say, hey, Let's try you in another position that gives you a little bit more responsibility. It's not much. You're still going to be in the games area, and you're still going to be, you know, operating the games. I said, okay, cool. Six months later, I got promoted to supervisor of my own area, and that was the responsibility of training the staff, the game staff there, and, you know, actually setting up the whole games, games area. Did that for a year and a half, excuse me, a year and a couple months, and then they actually promoted me to area supervisor from there. The biggest thing, to be totally honest, is not trying to do everything on your own, like developing a team that buys to buys into the situation that you're in, you know, that understands what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. And at that young age, you know, everybody's out there, okay, we just need to make people have fun. We just make a little bit of money. Okay, cool. That, that was the strategy. Have fun, make money, right? Seeking understanding is my biggest piece to keep me focused. Because when you try to do things off of an assumption, you'll mess up. It's okay to do, it's okay to mess up off a calculated, you know, risk or a calculated decision because you can say, okay, I've seen this done before, this is how they taught me, maybe this situation will want the same results. Let's try it that way. But when you don't understand, that's how you lose focus because now you're trying to do these things. You're trying to rebuild yourself from that mistake and then you're trying to move forward. You can't do that. I'm the type of person I will ask you seven times before I'm out on my own because I need to understand what I am doing. Separation, you know, when I'm at school, I'm at school. I'm not worried about work. I'm not really worried about track too much. You know, when it's when we're at track meet, you never heard me talk about work. I don't care. This is not what we're working on right now. And when I'm at work, I'm not about to run no track meet. And I'm not about to do no homework. Like I said, I'm a person. I separate things in my mind every day. Like I said, if it doesn't have anything to do with what I'm doing now, I cannot. It cannot be on my plate. And I'm telling you, it, when you when you understand that, you know, a lot of people. Oh, my grandma's in the hospital. You know, I got to go to work. I got to pick up my son tomorrow. I got to do this. Okay, but well, what, what do you need to do in this next hour? That's what you need to focus on. Because you worrying about everything that you got to do later is going to mess up what you need to do now. What you have to understand is, A, you're not trying to do everything at once. That's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to figure out, A, what's important now? What can I put off later? And who can help me? That's the biggest piece. Who can help me? I would like to say that a sense of we can be professional and we can have fun at the same time because a lot of people have a misconstrued sense of what professionalism is you know a lot of people think hi my name is ron duncan that's professionalism you know we can have a good time we can laugh we can joke we can dance you know we can get other people to come in and dance and we can still have fun and we can still drive the business forward being yourself is the most professional you can you can be you know you don't need to try to have a suit and tie on if that's not you if you do need to dress up dress up your way present yourself in the way you want to be viewed don't make it something that is not make it what you want it to be and do it because you want to do it not because someone's making you do it have fun so I am currently in the district managing training program, which is kind of awesome to, you know, not have been there that long, to be able to travel, and more specifically, I mean, I do a lot of training at other stores. So we host what we call floor director trainings, and we do a lot of, you know, hiring events. 
and I am one of the ones who actually goes down and actually hosts those events or hosts those training workshops. And you know, the cool part about it is you actually get to meet a lot of different people. Um, ultimately, you know, district manager would be my next step. And you know, for me, it's it's not anything soon. Man, y'all mean the world to me, man. Like seriously, like back to that support system and that help that you always look for, right? You know, doing what I do and, you know, trying to get to where I want to be is, it's, it's a lot, you know, and I would be lying to you if I said it was easy, that I'm the best, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm far from it. I constantly make mistakes and I constantly have to re revisit that in my mind. Why, is that, why didn't that work? And then on top of that, you know, you got a ton of other things that you have to get done and, and people that you have to help out. And just, you know, it's just a lot of different parts that, that happen to what I'm trying to achieve. And, you know, to have people that you can talk to and say, hey, I suck today. Like, oh my God, I messed up this, this, and this. You know, just to have people back there in, the, in your corner to say, hey, dude, we all make mistakes. I'm the type of person who's always trying to do that for other people, but I need that too. I can list a lot of people. I really could. You know, I can I can list Austin, Tierra, you, Davina, Carlton, Amber, just a lot of people that I could go on and on about. You know, I just want to, you know, let everyone know, you know, everything that you guys do for me, to you it may seem small, but to me it means the world. You know, it's something about having people, genuine people, that understand who you are and understand where you're trying to go, who can input, nothing nothing physical, nothing, you know, nothing tangible, but can input things into it that drive it forward. And like I said, the list is so long, I keep thinking of people, as Brandon and Raven and Cordell and Britney's like, the list is like so infinite. Like, I don't know, I shouldn't have started naming anybody because somebody's gonna be like, oh man, you left me out. I'm like, I didn't mean to, but you know, everybody knows where, the, where their place is in my life and I can't say, you know, how much I appreciate it. Social media, let me see, what, what kind of social media? So I got Instagram, it's just RJ1100. Uh, my Facebook account is just my name, Ronald Duncan. What else do I have? Do I have, I have Twitter, RJ1100. Um, I haven't used Twitter in so long, but you can reach me on that as well. Um, and you know, I, I take messages in as well. You know, phone number 704-560-8432. You know, I'm never opposed to, you know, talking to anyone and helping someone out, you know, because at the end of the day, that's all we're here to do for each other. And you know, lift each other up and motivate and, and get everybody on the right track. So, you know, reach, reach out to me. I'm willing to talk to anyone and anywhere. Um, just let me know. Thank you everyone for watching this episode of Under the Pressure. Be sure to check out our Facebook page for updates and to be included in on various discussions. Tune in same time next month and remember, motivation starts with you.